The Literary City with Ramji Chandran, exclusively on indigomusic.com. Hello, I'm Ramji Chandran, and welcome to the Literary City podcast on indigomusic.com. My guest today is the former world chess champion Vishwanathan Anand. He wrote a book recently called Mind Master. It's all about his career and his challenges, and it's teeming with life lessons. I talked to him about his journey from talented kid to grandmaster to world chess champion, and I was lucky to play a game with him live on the air. It's all quite fun. Chess is a finite game with finite variables, but yet phrases like infinite possibilities and unpredictable outcome seem completely appropriate while discussing chess. So it begs the question, how finite is finite? Finite can be a very large number, so large that it may as well be infinite. For instance, they have calculated that the number of possibilities of moves and resulting positions in the first 10 moves of a chess game is a 14-digit number. It's called the Shannon number, and the number is 69,352,859,712,417 possibilities. Yes, that's finite, but not a finite thing for some people. I can't count that high myself. And then they say chess is the only game in the world without an element of chance. There's no wind factor, no pitch whose inconsistencies make a ball wobble, no noisy enchanting spectators, no rain, no complaining about being dealt a poor hand. There are two players and only they are responsible for their outcomes. But far from chess being something that can only be handled by robots, the most important variable in chess is the human variable. But with humans, all variables don't have to be outside variables. Often, we turn inwards. And then chess becomes a game where strategies go beyond the book. My guest today, Vishwanathan Anand, is all about a passion for chess. He is grandmaster, world champion several times over. He is the author of Mind Master, winning lessons from a champion's life. There's information about Anand and the book in the podcast description. But in short, Anand is a super grandmaster of the game and was reigning world champion for years until he recently handed the crown to Magnus Carlsen. At that level of the game, when you have, as opponents, equally matched grandmasters who have narrowed it down to predictable lines of play, all sorts of other factors come into it. In his book, Anand speaks of how in cases he looks for little tells, just like poker players do. The differences in the way an opponent breathes in places, a tightening of the shoulder muscles, a change in demeanor. Articulate and well-spoken and possessed of a great and often wacky sense of humor, how bad can a guy be when his inspiration is Monty Python? Anand's book is a delight to read. At so many levels, as motivational lessons for winning, for chess buffs like me who worship the game, or as the autobiography of a world champion who has the gift of humility on his side. You don't need to know a whit about chess for this book to make sense. I first met Vishy Anand at the Rashtrapati Bhavan in New Delhi at the President of India's National Awards Ceremony. He was there to receive a Padma Shri, and he was a teenager, In response to something I said, he asked politely, Oh, you play chess? Yes, I replied, but not as well as you do. That was 30-something years ago. Anand went on to be a grandmaster and world champion, and I played chess with as much mediocrity as I did back then. But I spent the last couple of days completely engrossed in his book, and it is my privilege to be able to invite him here today as a guest on my show. Vishwanathan Anand, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. To begin with, let's talk about the human element of chess. Now, to quote you, you write, No matter what you might be feeling emotionally, being inscrutable at the board is a vital skill. So is playing chess like playing poker? In chess, the information is all contained in the chess board. In the sense, there is no hidden information. Nonetheless, um, In reality, it is much closer to poker because uh, the chess player is influenced by his opinion about what is happening. It may be inaccurate, but he's going to go with it. (laughs) And therefore, insight into that is critical 
for planning your moves. If I know that my opponent is on the completely false track, it will influence uh, the moves I select. Equally, if I know that he's found the right way or what I believe to be the right way, that has an influence over. So you, I think there is considerable value to uh, keeping your emotions and thoughts to yourself. Writing in the New York Times in 1972, Richard Roberts said, There is a great deal of emotion. With some people, it is passion, which perhaps makes chess closer to love than to poker. Yes, but that is from the outside. And when the heat and dust of the battle have settled, in a sense, logic takes over again. But uh, to understand what happened, you have to get into the heads of the participants. And it's only what they feel. If one of them is angry, that's what's coming through. If one of them is in love, that's what's coming through. Uh, if some of them is caught, if one of them is caught in the the beauty of a game, love is coming through, not uh, logic. It is the main facet of human chess, as opposed to computer chess. But even the computer chess can be said to be the uh, the emotions of the programmer. <laughs> so <laughs> you can work this backwards. <laughs> so. First time I've heard that. Sure. You know, it is said that there is no element of chance in chess, just you and your opponent and your respective psychologies. So as a chess player, is your super ego in check or is it always in play? It is almost always in play. Uh, uh, it's a bit like telling someone you should try not to be biased <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you go about it in chess we always try to play the best move uh, we try to go with the accurate evaluation of the position we believe these are important uh, training methods to play better chess you know working to find these things but um, anybody who's played the game for a long time will understand that um, it's our failure to come even close to these uh, ideals that decides the results in everything. So it's hard to explain, for instance, why in one of my most success between my most successful tournament and one of my worst tournaments, I will struggle to explain the exact difference between how I was feeling. It's just my opponent in the in the one that went badly, my opponent seemed to uh, hit my weak spot much earlier. In the one that went well, they struggled to find it. But there was a weak spot. There was something I was worried they would do. And in the good ones, they never get drawn to it. In the bad ones, they get there immediately. It's, uh, there is this random element and you can never take it away. In terms of superego and ambition and confidence, I remember an interview that you gave to a magazine or a paper in Chennai many years ago. I believe this was when you were in your teens. Maybe you had just won the national or whatever tournament it was. I recall you saying, I'll first get my grandmaster norm And then who knows, maybe I'll try for the world championship. It was a fairly preposterous thing for a Madras or Indian kid to say at the time. It it also set up a sort of excitement among chess enthusiasts that maybe you just had it in you. You were 17. What were you thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. In a sense, I, I used to phrase things in that way. And it seemed to me that you had to think you were on the way to the world title. It, but it's, it's not like I had ever analyzed my games, compared them to my peers and it, it thought it wasn't a logical answer. I just thought I, I will try for the world championship. That much is clear whether I'll succeed is another story but I will try for it. On the way, first let me get this Grandmaster thing out of the way. The Grandmaster title though felt much more realistic at that point because it was just one or two steps away. The world title, who knew but it was something everyone did. I mean, I, I thought the whole point of a chess player was to try for the world title. But quite a few people have mentioned that even when I was younger, even 14, uh, 13, 14, that I used to give this answer that one day I'll become world champion. But it was never based on any objective belief. I just thought, if you don't believe that, then what's the point? Well, in hindsight, the point is that you had this ambition without apology. Now, in cricket, for instance, Kapil Dev is credited with being the guy who changed Indian cricket simply by suggesting that we should win every game. You weren't a grandmaster yet when you suggested that you were going to become a grandmaster and then the world champion. Now, today's grandmasters in India, there have been a few since, right? They stand on your shoulders. I don't know which it was. I feel that my grandmaster title may have been the a bigger one because that's the one that so many have followed. So now we have 75 grandmasters. And there's a bit of the snowball. I was the first. We got the second one three years later. Uh, and it slowly got to six grandmasters by 2000, I think. And uh, so the vast majority of, of our GMs have actually been produced in the last 10 years. And the vast majority of our grandmasters are quite young. But uh, 
but yes, it was. It's hard to describe nowadays what a psychological barrier the Grandmaster title was. In fact, the question which was asked then and has been asked, uh, the variant of it has been asked in the Olympics, which is, why can't India India win a medal or win a gold medal? At some point, we would uh, look back on hockey and uh, this one uh, Olympic gold medal and say, you know, why why can a nation of how many of a million cannot win a gold medal? And it's not like we're drowning in them now, but uh, we already have two gold medals. We have uh, several medals. You know, it doesn't feel preposterous to think it, but uh, at a time it was. In, maybe in 2002 or 2004, it still felt... Uh, you could get away with the explanation of we are not sporting, We are maybe it's our hygiene, maybe it's our diet, uh, maybe it's the shape of our body. You could get away with that kind of explanation. Now it sounds ridiculous to say it, but then. And uh, in, in chess, it was a psychological barrier, but I went through it fairly quickly. There's a, uh, in the book, I of course cover this because it was a very important milestone. Yes, you do. Uh, and it took two years of failing before it, it just happened. But what was surprising for me uh, was that it just happened. In effect, I had not realized that I had become a stronger player. And so I had not realized that it was now within my grasp. And then it just, uh, it seemed to flow effortlessly. And uh, to my credit, I was not uh, surprised. (laughs) uh, (laughs) You're talking about the year 2000s. I'm saying that it sounded preposterous in 1986. That's right, absolutely. Speaking of shoulders and standing upon, you wrote... If juxtaposed, I consider my journey in the sport to be much easier than someone like Fisher's. In his time, he really had to give up everything to become a chess player. I didn't. How so? You know, when you decided to go professional, you chose not to get yourself a steady job or suffer the pulls and pressures of middle-class Tamilian families. (laughs) I speak more of your internal pressure than whatever pressures parents of society may or may not have placed upon you. So what was your plan B? There was an official plan B, which is that I would continue to do my BCom. That was the pretense. But to be honest, even with the exchange rate at that time, it seemed to me that a a grandmaster's uh, earnings were comparable to any job in India at that point. Uh, At that time, it seemed a grandmaster's life seemed like a very good deal. And I never seriously had a plan B. And that part about Bobby Fisher? When he... uh, was playing, you could live in many, uh, in the Eastern Bloc, in Warsaw packed countries, because you would get some kind of state support for being a chess player, and uh, that was it. But there was no system of decent financial, um, uh, I mean, tournaments with attractive financial conditions and so on. The Western players often juggled multiple jobs and tried to play on the side. Uh, And so we never had a thing. And Bobby was the one who changed that. He changed it the moment it became incredibly lucrative for him. He stopped playing chess, which is crazy, but that's another story. But he's the one, most people feel that he's the one who fought for it and uh, insisted on it and uh, made it happen for the rest of us. Now, in your chapter on prep, you speak of Sweden's Ferdinand Hellers and you wrote Mm -hmm. that Sweden didn't have a Russian chess culture and he was self-driven. Now, when you started to tilt at your windmills, India didn't have a stable full of grandmasters either, none in fact. You drove yourself when the dominant uh, chess country, Russia, had splendid ecosystems for the game. On page 123, you wrote, Russian cabbies will checkmate you with a smirk. In fact, it's not true. I have never met a cab driver who's that strong a player. (laughs) But uh, that was the myth. You felt you were going... And it's a bit the same in India. I'm sure the... Uh, anybody who lands in India feels that his cab driver can play a bit of cricket or something. I don't know what's the battle. but <laughs> Closer than you think. You know the uh, chess players, those hustlers in Washington Square Park in New York? Uh-huh. I-, I love playing with those guys. Anyway, this is just after you were in the news for something you had done. I can't remember which. And it was a Sunday, so I walk up to uh, one of those hustlers and ask for a game. He turns around, takes one look at me and goes, Hell no. <laughs> That's the ultimate compliment, isn't it? <laughs> he thought I was Vichy. <laughs> so, moving forward, how did you uh, how did you prepare for the big leagues when you were self-taught? Did you uh, pull up Fisher? Did you learn Russian? Buy Russian chess books? Read Russian books? Uh, I I used to read Russian chess books. I learned. I figured out the alphabet. I did not learn to speak Russian. I figured out the alphabet, which means right. I could tell who was playing, who was white, and who was black. I pretty sure. soon learned. 
uh, who had resigned, white or black. So that was also helpful. Okay. But I couldn't read anything else. There's nothing right. else I understood. But that was enough. It, you felt like you were getting secret information from a magical world or something. Manuel Aaron once said in an interview many, many years ago that the way to build chess champs is to teach kids a lot of openings and pit them with theory. Now, that's when I realized that I could never be a competitive chess player. <laughs> so, did you pit yourself with theory? Yes, I, I, I studied. In fact, I was hungry for theory because I had so little of it. It strikes me that I was actually kind of naive in the sense that whatever was published, I would believe it uh, fully. I, it, never, it never really fully sunk in that the other players were being uh, coy with their information. Uh, uh, so, just releasing enough to be able to publish it, but not giving away too much and so on. But it was good enough because I was so good a player myself that I could take those little bits and then conjure up something on my own on the board. It gave me the confidence to go and sit on the board feeling and I'm not going to lose the game very fast. How how much does intuition figure in a game that is supposed to be entirely logical? Uh, it's your nose. There's There are the positions where you just feel one move. You feel it very strongly. You feel it should be the right move or you feel it's the wrong move. Um, and uh-huh. as anyone who... Uh, has studied the concept of bias will understand once you have your intuition whether your intuition is influencing your calculation or your calculation is uh, feeding into your intuition it is very hard to separate um, but as you get closer to the time control or you get into positions where you have little time you have to depend more and more on your intuition when you cannot solve a problem you have to say well this is my gut feel this is what I go with and uh, right. Right. But information and uh, calculation are connected with each other. The more you work on your calculation, the better your intuition gets. So if you do a lot of work mm-hmm. on an area and then come back some months later and play, you'll find your intuition is giving you much better guesses. So neither is static. Both are developing and they're influencing each other. Now, is it true that grandmasters, even though they've stared at the board for a very long time, often make the move that they had thought of in the first few seconds? Yes, Um, The move you thought about in the first few seconds is probably a decent move. Unless there is some obvious failing, it happens quite often that uh, I I think a move is good. I leave it for 10 minutes and uh, after 9 minutes and 45 seconds, it suddenly hits me, it loses a piece. That has happened. But more likely, uh, if your move doesn't fail pretty fast... uh, that's what your heart wants to play. And your heart tends to trump your mind in this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is fascinating, isn't it? And it leads me to believe that blitz games can be as deep as the longer versions. That is our modern understanding of it. Uh, Botvinnik, Botvinnik used to say that uh, blitz is bad for you and it should be used only in moderation. As a, I mean, he seemed to think Blitz was just the chessboard variation of having a drink with your buddies. Oh, really? Did he? When you play a lot of Blitz, you you realize that under pressure, what is it you actually remember and you don't remember? You, the details. I may think I've checked a line, but in Blitz, something unexpected will happen. And then when I play 10 Blitz games, afterwards I'm dying to go back and, and think... Uh, and put this order. And then later on, if I go over the structure many times, I I, I really understand something better. And Blitz allows you to test a lot of crazy ideas. You, But this these crazy ideas then allow you to almost, uh, let's say, stress test your chess. No, I know this is a hackneyed question, but does any game stand out for you in your career? There are probably 10 or 15 that stand out, but um, there were a couple of games I played recently Recently means in the last 15 years. <laughs> so, uh, Aronian in 2013 is the one I bring up very often because it was it was uh, almost identical in its patterns to one of the legendary games of chess played in 1907 by Rubinstein. So, you know, when you when you get to be that close to a masterpiece, you, it kind of has a special effect. And that blitz game that you played with Smirin, uh, I can't not bring it up. It's a blitz game. You're on a one minute mm-hmm. handicap, and uh, you took one minute and 34 seconds in the fourth move. You did win the game, but a minute and 34 seconds? What were you thinking? You know, it's funny. Um, I had completely forgotten about that game, and it didn't seem to be that significant. It seemed to me that I had a mental, not a blackout, but I had a phase where I was just mentally blank for a while, and I snapped out of it after a minute and a half. I didn't think it was such a big deal. But then what happened was, 
many years later without me realizing it this thing became a kind of thing on youtube and so so the algorithm the algorithm would throw up this one thing often and everyone found it funny also because there was some legendary commentary where uh, this man boris ashley who's a very big commentator he was and uh, daniel king was uh, there as well he said what is all of the doing what and ashley and king yeah ashley and king i think it was ashley and king but anyway king daniel king would say but wish he come on make a move what are you doing i think and uh, i myself was obli- oblivious to that effect okay but what was smirin thinking at the time i have not i have not asked smirin uh, i should ask smirin at some point what he thought of this whole mess because his perspective is missing what was he thinking when i was thinking for a minute and a half that's a good point i you, i never got around to asking him <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's very funny and the commentary was on steroids yes and you remember this position for our listeners i'm showing anand the position after move 36 in the 1995 world championship in new york against kasparov you'll see why it's significant the position after move 36 in the 1995 world championship in new york against kasparov you'll see why it's significant uh oh yeah i, I remember it well this is my game with kasparov where i should have played uh, two before rather than allowing him to that makes that mistake makes me angry that one because i was so winning in that if i had done this i would probably have beaten him and uh, it would have changed my life could you explain because he was a difficult opponent me for me for the next 10 years but if i had won that game he would have been less difficult for me because it was confidence blah 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 so you know i was uh, reminded of it more recently when i was playing one of those internet online uh, guess the best move things ah okay and you know what i guessed rook h4 and the website says no but that's what bishi played oh god <laughs> good enough for bishi good enough for me <laughs> Okay, you first won the title in 2000 and then in 2007. I won't bother you with the banality of uh, which is the sweeter victory, lots have been said about it, but in either case, describe your feelings mm-hmm. on being right on top. How did it feel in the hotel room that evening? 2000 felt brilliant because uh, the title had eluded me on three attempts and I'd finally made it and so on. But it had already happened a few days before ah ah yes i get it the thing is uh, it's not like you win in a shot mostly you're relieved you've completed the job without botching it that's maybe the dominant emotion then there was the feeling of celebration when you come back home and everybody is celebrating congratulating you you get invited here and there you go to see the president sure that that phase always seems to me i feel like i'm uh, someone it's happening somewhere else and i'm standing there uh, like a hologram and I'm observing it that's the feeling you have uh, you cannot say why but you by that point uh, you have moved on and you're enjoying the fact that it means something to somebody else but it is stopped to me stop meaning something to you and now in your chapter on you're becoming an elder of the profession in uh, the chapter title staying alive inspired by the bgs no doubt you write i can't recall the first time i felt old Yes, I I've gone through umpteen school reunions and uh oh <laughs> especially with your classmates uh, having a school reunion you feel 15 again and everyone looks at you and oh, who these bunch of old guys <laughs> <laughs> That's funny has growing older affected your cognitive skills in any way is chess player I used to make blunders I still make blunders uh I guess I make them for different reasons now You think you were a stronger player before but what it is is you actually interpreting your results from earlier and thinking I was better. I nonetheless have a sense now that uh, the center of gravity in chess has shifted towards youth heavily thanks to computers. Right. Because I see all my people of my age cohort struggling and are mm-hmm. working mm-hmm. much harder or the ones who are not adapting falling behind and so you see see certain patterns and you realize this is what must be happening. but it'll take a huge amount of data analysis to make make some laws out of it um if you see what i mean right um right. and over time i realize i'm i'm just making blunders there are things that used to be effortless for me that are being harder and even allowing for the fact that um our understanding of the game has advanced to the point that nothing is simple anymore uh, i still feel that chess is harder than it used to be or less fun than it used to be now it can be other things it can be that you think more about family and uh, maybe everyone has a feeling of the number of chess results they can get excited about before the brain moves on it could be multiple things but undoubtedly there's an effect and again you go back to the data point you look at the list and you realize the are crawling all over it and the older players are getting rarer and 
you 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 then conjure up exp- explanations for that but i think it's fairly consistent that's really very well said well anyway congratulations on the new federation appointment what do you have to do in this gig uh, i will have to attend uh, one general assembly every year uh, and go to multiple council meetings where there's a lot of work and uh, i get a chance to enact some of my own priorities so if i want to bring uh, get free day more into chess in india or uh, push women's chess a bit more uh, uh, help enact rules i can interact with various commissions and it gives me a kind of institutional role to affect that rather than being someone from the outside writing a letter saying can can this happen or that happen That's fantastic. And I know we discussed this off the air, but let me ask you on the air, how's the academy coming along? Very nicely. So, um it's going very well. We set a target of how do we get a lot of our people to 2700, you know, how do we make our presence felt at the top of world chess? And uh, two of our youngsters have already cracked it, maybe two or three years ahead of schedule. So, That's great. it's uh it feels it feels very very good right now and who are your biggest success stories let's say by sh- by purely numbers gokesh would stand out so the three of them who are the strongest right now by one measure or the other is pragnananda arjun erigaisi and uh, gokesh as i mentioned earlier they have your shoulders to stand on which is good for them now before i let you go i simply have to ask you this question can i play a game with you sure Where do, where do you want to play? Oh, I thought we just call out the moves. Okay, we can do that. Yeah. Do you want to play black, white? Oh, I thought if I played white, I'd have a good chance of beating you. Well, I'll I'll just have to run the gauntlet. <laughs> <laughs> You're being very kind. All right. All right. Yeah. E4. Uh C5. Knight F3. Uh D6. D4. C takes D4. Knight takes. Knight F6. Knight C3. A6. Bishop E3. Knight G4. Queen D2 uh knight takes E3 queen takes okay uh, G6 bishop C4 bishop G7 knight in D to E2 castles castles queen side uh knight C6 bishop D3 uh bishop D7 A3 rook to C8 king b1 uh b5 knight a2 uh rook to b8 <clears throat> ah, hindsight is 2020 all right here goes nothing rook d2 okay b4 a takes b4 knight takes b4 knight takes b4 rook takes knight knight c3 uh bishop takes c3 but of course i resign yeah <laughs> well thank you again so much for this thank you yeah you could have played c3 not knight c3 but now you tell me yeah. <laughs> sure <laughs> well more part your elbow on everything that you're doing with fide with the academy and let me say that the nation owes you hugely first of all for being a little kid from madras that struck out alone into the world and made it a world champion and secondly for everything you're doing to create the next Indian world champions. So, Vishy Anand, thank you so much for being my guest on The Literary City. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. You have been listening to Vishwanathan Anand, former world chess champion and author of a wonderful book, Mind Master. I will be back next week with none other than the fabulous Shobha Day. I am Ramji Chandran with the Literary City podcast on the always fun, always entertaining indigomusic.com.